Hello, ACCA students, and welcome to this TX in Focus webinar. We are going to be focusing on the latest examiner's report, and thank you so much for finding time to join us on this session. My name is Martin, and I'm part of the team that provides student support here at ACCA. And this session today is designed to support your preparation for the taxation exam. And for this, I'm very pleased to be joined by expert tutor Helen Forster. Now, before I hand over to Helen, I'd just like to share a few housekeeping uh, items and give you a bit of a guidance on some of the functionalities that you can use on this ON24 platform. So at the bottom of the screen, uh, you'll see a number of buttons. You'll see a help icon on the left, and that provides resources and information to help you resolve any technical issues that you might experience. There are some icons for the slides and the media player. So ensure you've selected this just so that you can be able to see the presentation and anything that is put up for you to see. Now, uh, there's an attendee chat function which will enable you to engage with fellow webinar attendees. And that icon is also somewhere at the bottom of your screen. We will be referring to a number of resources um, and these resources are available for you to access. You will see an icon that looks like a file symbol. And if you click on that, you'll be able to access those resources, including any direct links that we mentioned. Please remember you can rearrange your screen to suit you and resize your windows at any time. And just in case you can't hear what we are saying or if you experience any lag between the video and the audio, please just refresh your browser and that should resolve that problem. Now, if you've registered for this webinar, it means you receive an email tomorrow with details of how you can listen into the recording. So do not worry much if you miss out on something uh, as you'll be able to access the recording of this session. Now, we'll have a question and answer session at the end, tail end of this uh, webinar. So please do put in your questions by the Q&A button, which is the middle icon at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to the best of our ability to respond to as many questions as possible. So thank you so much. And now over to you, Helen. Thank you, Martin. Hi, everybody. So I'm Helen Forster. And uh, when I'm not doing webinars for the ACCA, I work for Catplan as a tax tutor and a content specialist. So I've been working there for nearly 27 years now, I think it is. And uh, so today, what I want to do with you is to go through some of the key points from the September, December 2023 examiner's report. So I'm going to look through some of the questions from that report and some of the key exam tips, and uh, then talk about some of the common mistakes that you might make and how to avoid those. And then we'll move on to the live Q and A's at the end of the session. So we'll make a start then with the examiner's report. And the examiner's report from the most recent set of exams that have been released covers some of the questions from Section A. Now, Section A in your exam is, of course, going to be 15 objective test questions on any area of the syllabus. So it's really important that you try to revise all areas here. And these questions are not released on the pl practice platform. It's quite hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, the examiner's report does have a selection of questions. So there are actually four questions in the report. And I'm going to go through three of those with you today. Now, the first question that is released in the examiner's report is all about national insurance contributions. So national insurance is one of those taxes that often gets overlooked, but it can be worth some nice easy marks in the exam. So this first question from the examiner's report is actually about class four national insurance contributions. It's a multiple choice question. So you just need to choose the correct answer. And we have to calculate Raj's class four national insurance contributions for the tax year 2022-23. And we've got a couple of figures here. We've got some trading profit and we've got some property income. So you'll need to think about which of those is going to be subject to national insurance. Now, one of the most important things when you're dealing with national insurance is to remember to use the tax tables. In the exam, I've just popped up an extract here. 
you have a set of tax tables and for national insurance particularly because the rates have been changing recently and if you have studied using older tax materials you need to make sure you're using the correct rates for your exam so the tax tables have all of the different classes of national insurance and we're looking at class four and in the tables you've got the rates and you've got the tax bands so all you need to do is to make sure that you're applying this to the correct figure. So you have a choice of two, and it's actually just the trading profits that will be subject to class four national insurance contributions. Now, when you're doing section A of the exam, in section A, if you're doing this remotely, you will probably here want to use the scratch pad to do your calculations. If you're sitting it in a center, then you are allowed to have scrap paper. But it's a good idea to get used to using the scratch pad, particularly for calculations such as this. Don't try to just type it all into your calculator in one go because that's an easy way to go wrong. So the way that I would do this would be to pop up the scratch pad, make sure I pick the right figure. So it's the trading profit of 52,000 which is going to be subject to class four, and then make sure that we use the right rates. So the first £12,570 is at 0%, and then between the limits, 12,570 up to 5,270 is at 10.25%. So I would just uh, write that out as a working. Now I've shown this in the scratch pad properly with brackets. You don't need to do that, of course. Nobody sees the scratch pad in the exam apart from you. So you can make your workings as brief as you like, as long as you understand them. But for a several step calculation like this one, it's a good idea to use that scratch pad to make sure that you get the correct answer. So the bit between the limits at 10.25% and then above the upper limit is at 3.25%. So that gives a total of 3,920. So fortunately, that is one of the answers, and that is answer B. And remember that for section A, you get two marks for every question that you get right. You don't get marks taken away if you get the wrong answer, but you would, of course, score zero. Now, the other thing to remember when you're doing section A is that all of these other answers where it's a multiple choice question are carefully devised so that you will get one of those answers if you make a simple mistake. Now, for a calculation question like this one, I wouldn't in the exam try to prove all of the other answers. But one obvious thing is if you're not quite sure whether or not to include the property income, have a go at working out the national insurance with that. But unfortunately here, that is in fact answer D. So answer D uses all of the correct rates, but includes the property income as well. Now, the other two incorrect answers in this one actually use the class one rates. So hopefully, if you've popped up the tax tables, you at least will have just a choice of two possible answers because you'll know that those are definitely wrong. So that was the first example from the examiner's report. The second example, the second question is all about groups of companies for corporation tax. So you need to make sure that you learn the definitions of the corporation tax groups. And this question is about group relief groups, so losses groups. Now, this one is a slightly different style of question because there are two statements which are correct. And these are all about claiming group relief. Now, the first thing that I would do with a question like this, where there isn't a group structure diagram, We've got some details about the percentage shareholdings, but what I would be doing is trying to bring about a group structure diagram. So we have X, which has 60% of Y. So we'll call them X, Y, and Z for this one. 80% um, of Z. So we've got a group structure with two direct shares and we're looking at the year ended 31st of December 2022. And we have one of those shareholdings which was acquired on the 31st of March 2022. 
So if you've got scrap paper, then obviously it's much easier to draw a group structure diagram. So we have X, 60% of Y, 80% of Z. If you're using the scratch pad, you have to be a little bit more creative when it comes to drawing diagrams, but you can kind of do it. So you can uh, do it as I've illustrated in the scratch pad here, but just without the actual lines. So we have X with 60% of Y, 80% of Z. So you then should be thinking which of these companies can be in a group relief group. So you need to remember the percentage that's needed to form a losses group. So hopefully you would remember that we need at least a 75% share to form a losses group, which means that X, which owns 75% or more of Z, X and Z can be in the same group, but Y has to be excluded because 60% is of course less than 75%. Now that immediately means that you can eliminate option C because option C says that YAC, so Y can claim group relief of 90,000 from Zeus Limited. So we know that that is incorrect. And we also know then that D is one of the correct answers because that is stating the same thing pretty much the opposite way around. Y cannot claim group relief from Z. So that immediately gives us one of our correct answers and eliminates one of those answers. But to differentiate between A and B, we need to think a bit more carefully about this. Now, the other thing to note here is that Z is acquired part way through the year. So Z has a trading loss of £180,000 but Z was only acquired at the end of March. Now, when a company joins a group partway through the year, we have to time a portion when it comes to group relief for losses. So we've got two options. X can claim group relief of 135,000 from Zeus, or X can claim group relief of 180,000. Now, if you've spotted that Z has only joined partway through the year, then you'll know that B can't be right because we have to time a portion that loss. And because they've been part of the group for nine months of the year, that means that nine twelfths of the loss, which is 135,000, is the amount that could be transferred. So strictly, it would be the lower of that loss or nine twelfths of X's profits for the same period. But because X's profits are more than the loss, then we take the lower figure, which is the 135,000. And where it's a question that has two possible correct answers, like this one, unfortunately, you do have to get both of those right to score the two marks. If you just got one of those right, you don't score one mark, you score zero. So it's all or nothing. You either get both of those questions correct or you score nothing. So that is the second question. Um, the third question that I want to look at, so this is the last one that I'm going to look at from section A, is one that I want you to get involved with as well. So what we'll do is we'll have a look at this one, have a look at the statements, and then I'm going to pop up a poll slide to give you the chance to put in what you think is the correct answer. A bit of audience participation. And this one, is all about capital gains tax gift holdover relief. So the capital gains tax reliefs, you need to make sure that you learn the rules, you learn the conditions. And this is all about two disposals. And we've got four statements. One of those statements is true. We've got Daniel and Daniel has a 30% share in a partnership, a manufacturing partnership, which he's owned since 2016. He's going to dispose of that entire interest, it says, by selling it to his son for less than its market value. So that's our first disposal, a sale for less than market value of a share in a partnership. The second transaction is Daniel, who has been a director and a 10% shareholder in an unquoted investment company, it says, since 2012, and has decided to give his shares to his daughter. 
So that's a gift of shares. So basically, the statements, the first statement is that gift holdover relief is available on the disposal of the interest in the partnership, but not the shares. So the first one qualifies, but not the second. Option B is that gift holdover relief is available on the shares, but not the interest in the partnership. Option C is gift holdover relief is available for both of those disposals. Or the final one, gift holdover relief is available on neither disposal. So if I give you a little bit of time to just think about that, and then I'll pop up the four possible answers. And as I say, there will be a poll on the next screen for you to then enter which one you think is the correct answer. OK, so if I give you a little bit of time to think about that one. You ready? OK, so which of those statements is true? Gift holdover relief on the disposal of the partnership, but not the shares, or the shares, but not the partnership, or both disposals, or neither disposal? Some answers coming in. a little bit longer. It's always worth a guess. In the real exam, if you don't know, you just guess. You've got a one in four chance of guessing it right. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to eliminate at least one or two of those that you know is definitely not right. OK, so I think we've got nearly half of you have answered that already. Let's give you a second or two longer. Last chance. OK, let's have a look and see. So we have a variety of answers there. And the correct answer was, in fact, not the second one, which the biggest percentage of you chose, but the first statement. OK. So quite a tricky one, which is probably why it was put in the examiner's report in the first place. So for gift holdover relief, the conditions that you need to try to remember, gift holdover relief is avail not just available not just for gifts, but also if we have a sale at undervalue. So that's what we had in the first one. And it's available for disposals of qualifying assets. Now, the qualifying assets for gift holdover relief are unquoted trading company shares. So any percentage of shares in an unquoted trading company. So unquoted usually means it's a limited, not a PLC. Quoted shares in a personal trading company. So if it is shares in a PLC and you've got at least 5%, then that will qualify. And then assets used in the trade of the donor, where the donor is a sole trader or a partner or assets used in the donor's personal company. So for this one, what we actually had for the first disposal was a share in a manufacturing partnership. So that must be then assets used in a partner's trade. So that would actually qualify for gift holdover relief. The second one would have qualified if it was a trading company, but because that was an investment company, and it even says in brackets, non-trading company, those shares do not qualify for gift holdover relief. 
Okay. So the answer there was statement A. So quite a tricky one. And you do need to remember the conditions for all of the capital gains tax reliefs. And a lot of those are quite similar as well. So the other big relief is business asset disposal relief. Business asset disposal relief is available for similar assets, but where we've got a whole business or part of a business and uh, for business asset disposal relief, it has to have been owned for at least two years. There's no minimum holding period for gift holdover relief. And then for business asset disposal relief for shares, it still has to be a trading company. And then the individual has to own 5% and work for the company for at least two years. So business asset disposal relief, similar conditions, but slightly stricter. So those were just a selection of questions from the examiner's report. So as I say, there are four questions in total from section A. Moving on now to section B. Now section B in the real exam has three case scenarios, each of which has five objective test questions, all covering the same tax. Now, these are not released on the practice platform from the most recent exam either, but we have one of those case scenarios in the examiner's report. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole thing here as we don't have enough time, but what I want to do is to have a look at one of the questions from this scenario, which is on inheritance tax. And in section B, section B could cover pretty much anything. The ones certainly that we've seen released tend to be on inheritance tax, capital gains tax, and VAT. So that's because in section C, we have a whole question on income tax, a whole question on corporation tax. And so that's why I think we tend to see the inheritance tax, capital gains tax, and VAT tested in section B. But in theory, section B could cover any area. And the one that's in the most recent examiner's report has a selection of questions, typical selection. So we've got death tax on a lifetime gift. We have death tax on the death estate with a resident's nil rate band. There's a question about allowable deductions in the death estate. We've got due dates, and then we've got a calculation of lifetime tax on a chargeable lifetime transfer. And it's actually that final question that I want to have a look at with you now. I know inheritance tax, is one of the trickier taxes. So I thought it might be quite nice to have a look through this question. And the questions in the scenario, although it's five objective test questions on the same scenario, they are all independent questions. So in that section B scenario, if you get one of the questions wrong, then that shouldn't then impact on any of the other questions. So you should still be able to get all of the other ones right. And the information in the scenario tends to be presented in the same order as the questions. So it should be fairly easy to find the information that you need. So really, these are pretty much the same as the Section A questions. So again, if it's a multiple choice question, you've got two marks for getting it right. Have a go. They don't take marks away if you get it wrong. Um, and two marks for getting the question right, zero if you get it wrong. So this one asks for the amount of lifetime inheritance tax payable by Diane for a chargeable lifetime transfer of £520,000. So Diane has transferred some money to a trust on the 1st of March 2023. Um, and as you read through this information, so all of this information is relevant for this question, but as you read through the information, you should be trying to think, why have they told me that? So we've got details about the transfer to the trust. And we've then got quite a lot of further information, which is going to be very important to get the right answer. So as I was reading through this, first bit of useful information is it says that Diane is going to pay the inheritance tax. So you should then be thinking, inheritance tax for a lifetime gift, the rate of tax depends on who pays that tax. And the way that I like to remember this is that if it's the donee that pays the tax, it's at 20%. If it's the donor, the person giving the gift, then it's a quarter. 
or 25 percent or 20 80ths, all of which are exactly the same. Uh, deliberate misspelling of the word quartal then to help me remember. <laughs> so the idea is that lifetime tax is at 20 percent, but if the donor is giving the gift and paying the tax, then we treat the gift as if it's net of tax. So that's where that 20 80ths fraction comes from. OK, so we have 20 80ths as our rate of tax, which is the same as 25 percent for any non mathematicians out there, which is the same as a quarter. So that's the first thing we need to make sure that you're using the correct rate of tax. Now, the other thing is that when you're working out death tax on a uh, sorry, lifetime tax on a lifetime gift, we need to make sure that you're using the correct nil rate band. So this is where we've got some information about a previous chargeable lifetime transfer. So if we look at the dates there, that was just about a year before this one. So that's definitely within the last seven years. And we've also got a potentially exempt transfer. Now, the thing to remember is that it's only chargeable transfers that will use the nil rate band. Because we're working out lifetime tax, the potentially exempt transfer is still potentially exempt. So we can ignore that. And in this one, just to make life a little bit easier, they've already applied the exemptions. So there would be an annual exemption for the current year and the previous tax year, which in this case would actually have been used by the transfers in 2022, because those are in the same tax year as the CLT that we're dealing with. But read the information carefully. Those have been taken into account already. So we can forget the annual exemption. We just need to make sure that we get the right nil rate band and use the right rate of tax. So the calculations, again, use the scratch pad. It's quite a tricky computation to do without writing anything down. So we have the CLT, the nil rate band of £325,000, which you can get from the tax tables. And then we look back seven years for GCTs. So that's the gross chargeable transfers, which is just our 70,000 CLT. So that gives us an available nil rate band of 255,000 and the excess is taxed at 25%, which gives answer A. Again, how are those other answers calculated? So for something like this, you don't need to try to prove all of them. But if you're not sure about one particular point, then it's worth just having a go. And, and if that answer doesn't come up, then you know that that's definitely wrong. So the other answers here, B does the most obvious incorrect thing, which is using the PET, deducting the PET from the nil rate band as well. So that takes off the 30,000 to the sister. Answer C uses the wrong rate. So that uses 20% instead of 25%. And answer D uses the full nil rate band without any deductions. And I recommend that you have a look at the examiner's report for the other questions as well, because those are really good practice. And those are all in the correct Finance Act. So if you're doing the exam in March, then that is still going to be based on the Finance Act of 2022, which is the same one as is used for all of these questions. OK, so that was section B. So section B could be on anything, but most likely inheritance tax, capital gains tax and VAT. Section C, so this is the constructed response questions, and these are all released on the practice platform. So if you haven't looked at these already, then definitely worth having a go. Practice these questions um, and we've got some information in the examiner's report. So again, I'm not going to go through these questions in full, but I'm going to have a look at some of the key points and particularly how to present your answers for some of them, um, some of the common mistakes, how to maybe approach these. Starting off with the 10 mark question, which I think is probably the trickiest question because the 10 mark question is the higher skills question. Now, it could test pretty much anything. 
the question from the most recent examiner's report, from the most recent exam that's been released, is all about a director who is also a shareholder who is going to have a change in benefits. So instead of a salary, is going to receive a dividend. Instead of a mileage allowance, is going to receive a company car. And instead of a personal pension contribution, is going to have an employer pension contribution paid by the employer. The calculations, you've got to calculate the reduction in income tax and employee national insurance for the director. And for the company, the increase in corporation tax. Now, the first part of this question, if we have a look at this, is for seven marks. So this is to calculate the reduction in Bertie's income tax and employee class one, excuse me, class one NICs if the beneficial arrangements are implemented instead of the existing arrangements. Now, you must read the instructions carefully. This one specifically says to produce full income tax and employee class one NIC computations. So the key with this question, with the higher skills question, is to think before you start. So this one is probably going to look different compared to ones that you've seen before. Some of them will be similar, so there are obviously going to be similarities, but you will need to think before you start. So we've got to think about the income tax with the existing arrangements and with the beneficial, the new arrangements, which means it's going to be really important to use headings. So are you doing calculations for the existing arrangements? Are you doing calculations with the new arrangements? And label to say which tax you're calculating as well. So income tax and employee NIC contributions. So if we run through, um, so for this one, I've, I've picked out some of the information from the question to show you the kind of things that you should be thinking as you go through. So with the existing arrangements, we've actually got some very straightforward standard computations. So Rebyte Limited, that's the employer, pays gross director's remuneration of £75,000. So that's just like salary, employment income. So you should be thinking there, that's going to be subject to income tax, standard rates. And if we've got a receipt of cash, that will also be subject to employee class one NICs. And I've just put in a snippet from the tax tables, which we referred to earlier. So national insurance contributions, you just need to remember what these are paid on. So class one for the employee is on cash earnings and cash equivalents. We've got a mileage allowance. Now the mileage allowance in actual fact is exactly the HMRC approved amount, which means that that's not going to be subject to income tax. It's only if the individual received more than that or less than that that we'd have any sort of adjustment to make. And it's not going to be subject to NICs either. So we can pretty much ignore that. And Bertie's going to make personal pension contributions. And just watch out here, you're given the gross figure. So personal pension contributions, you should be thinking, that will extend the basic rate tax band. And I haven't produced the full answer for this one. You can go away, have a go at that. It's on the practice platform and the full answers are on there as well. But that then should be fairly straightforward. Now, the new arrangements are, instead of getting the remuneration, the company is going to pay Bertie dividends. So if you think dividends, we've got different income tax rates We've got the dividend mill rate band and then a whole different set of tax rates. And dividends are not subject to national insurance contributions. So you need to remember national insurance is only payable on earned income from employment or self-employment. So that Section A question that we saw earlier, trading profits are subject to national insurance, but not dividends, not savings, not property income. Okay. So you need to remember that. 
And Bertie is going to be provided with a company car. So again, you can get lots of help from your tax tables. The company car is a zero emissions car with a list price of 37,000. So in the tables, the percentage for electric cars with zero emissions is 2%. Nice and easy. So that you can use to work out the taxable car benefit and that will be taxed as non-savings. So car benefits is the same as employment income when it comes to taxing it. Now, slightly trickier, but for benefits, there are no employee national insurance contributions, although there would be employers national insurance. So there will be nothing for Bertie to pay in terms of NICs on that. Now, instead of personal pension contributions, Bertie is going to have contributions paid by the employer. Now, pension contributions are another slightly tricky area. So you need to remember that if it's an employer's pension contribution, then that is going to be an exempt benefit for the employee, which means that the 25,000 can be ignored when you're doing the calculations for Bertie. So the key with these questions is to think carefully before you start, think about all of the information um, and think about the computations that you're going to produce. So that was the first part of the question. The second part of this 10 mark question was for the company to work out the increase in the company's corporation tax if we implemented those beneficial arrangements. And this is only worth three marks. So for three marks, that should give you some guidance as to how long and how tricky this answer is going to be. So if you work on the basis of three hours for the exam, you've got 1.8 minutes per mark. So three times 1.8 is not much time at all, is it? It's five point something minutes. And again, look at the instructions. You're not expected to recalculate the corporation tax liability under the existing arrangements. So this question, they actually tell you how much tax the company is currently paying. All you then need to do is to think about how that's going to change. And if you're given a figure in the question, so if they tell you a figure for corporation tax or income tax, and, and they will normally say, don't recalculate this, but sometimes students still do. So if they tell you not to recalculate something, then please don't, because that is just a waste of time. So think about how the taxable profit will change. So for the company, with those beneficial arrangements, if we went through the same information again, you then need to try to think about the corporation tax implications. Dividends. So if you think dividends paid by a company are going to come from profits after tax. So the dividend is not going to be deductible. Where a company provides a company car, in this case, it says that the car is going to be leased by the company. So lease costs for cars are deductible. The only thing you need to be careful with is if the car was a high emissions car, so if it was more than 50 grams per kilometer, then part of that cost, 15%, would be disallowed. But because it's a low emission car, the lease cost is allowed in full. So lease costs for cars, fairly commonly tested in the exam. And the employer's pension contribution, when a company makes a payment for an employee, whether it's salary, pension contribution, that is going to be deductible. So actually, the answer to this was very, very simple. If you just started with the profit figure that was given in the question, so they told you the trading profit of the company. And then we've got the lease costs, which are deducted, the pension cost to give us a revised taxable total profit figure, and then multiply that by the tax rate, compare that to the figure that was given in the question for the corporation tax, and that is the increase. So even if you got some of this wrong, if you've put in the trading profit figure that they gave you, applied the tax rate of 19%, and that will be whether you get your answer right or wrong. So that's going to be based on your figure. 
And then OFR that I've put here stands for own figure rule. When you're working out the increase, it's just a case of comparing your figure to the figure given in the question. So if your figure's wrong, but you've clearly compared that to the figure that you were given, you would score that half mark. So even if you just took the trading profit, times it by 19% and compared it to the figure given, you'd get one and a half out of three, which is 50%, which puts you well on course for a pass. 50% is a pass. So that was quite a tricky question. Um, the 15 mark income tax question, if we just have a quick look at some of the key aspects from there. So this was actually split into three bits. The first part, which was 10 of the 15 marks, is some calculations of income tax. So typically this will have employment or self-employment, possibly both. So this was income tax for employment income with some benefits, dividends and some gift aid. There was a written section on the marriage allowance. So that's where you can transfer the personal allowance between a married couple or civil partners and a little bit on tax planning for a couple as well. And some of the key things that the examiner said about this income tax question, the first part was to calculate Esme's income tax liability and specifically said to include by the use of a zero any items which are not taxable or deductible. Now, if they tell you to do that, they will give you credit for doing that. So make sure you follow the instructions. The examiner also suggested, so you don't have to, but suggested that if you've got non-savings income and dividends, then a two column layout, so separated into non-savings and dividends, works well for your income tax computation. Other things that the examining team said, you can include simple workings in the main computation, that's fine. Any more complex workings are probably better kept separate. So suggested presentation, I've just popped this up and shown you the kind of thing that you might produce in the exam. So we've got the computation split into columns. Simple workings, if you're just multiplying a single figure by a percentage, then you can do that in the main computation. You can put workings in cells. It's always a good idea to write out the workings as well, just in case you make a mistake with formulae. Um, zero for non-taxable items. Make sure that you do actually put those in. If you left those out completely, then you would miss out on the marks for those. And here, the car benefits and the mileage, slightly more complicated. So separate workings for those and reference them. So you don't have to write out working one. You could write W1, for example. But if you're doing separate workings, it's always a good idea to cross-reference. So again, you can have a go at the full question from the practice platform, but those were just some of the key tips from the examiner on part A. The second part of this is something that's not something that we see tested massively often, but it's about the marriage allowance. So it was to explain. You do need to be prepared for some written elements in section C, how a married couple can reduce their income tax liabilities by claiming the transferable personal allowance or the marriage allowance and state why that's not possible for Esme and Andy. Now, there are only three marks here, so you don't want to be writing huge amounts, but you do need to provide a bit of detail. How does this work and why is it not possible? So you should be thinking there that it's going to be impossible if one of the spouses is a higher rate taxpayer. So that was what you should be thinking. And in your tax tables, again, you have the transferable amount. So even if you couldn't remember exactly how this worked, hopefully you would be able to point out that 1,260 of the personal allowance could be transferred from one spouse to the other. And to explain how that worked, you do need to give a little bit more detail. So the examiner said that those who kept it too general didn't score the marks here. We reduce the personal allowance for the one that's making the transfer. And for the receiving spouse, we actually get a reduction in the tax of 20% times that transferable figure. And a nice easy mark for saying why it's not possible. And in this case, it was because Esme is a higher rate taxpayer. 
And the final part of this income tax question was to explain how Esme and Andy's income tax liability would be affected if they transferred the shares from Esme to Andy. And it does say you're not expected to recalculate Esme's income tax liability. So again, follow the instructions, look at the number of marks, it's two marks. So two nice clear points is really all you should be looking to make here. And if we transfer the shares, that means that the dividends will now be effectively moved from one to the other. So to answer that one, you needed to think about the rates of tax on dividends and the dividend nil rate bands that would be available. OK, so again, you can work through the full question. Have a go at that on the practice platform. And then finally, the corporation tax question. So if we have a quick run through this and then uh, we shall be able to move on to some of your questions very shortly. So for the corporation tax question, we had a calculation of taxable total profits. So fairly standard adjustment of profits. Um, there was some property income, some chargeable gains with rollover relief, which is one of the key reliefs. That's the only relief that companies can claim and some qualifying charitable donations. And the next bit, section B, was a short section on loss reliefs. So for the first part of this, which was 11 marks, again, we had some instructions. Start with a trading profit based on the draft accounts. Indicate by use of zero any items that don't require adjustment. If you're given instructions, follow those instructions. And if you don't put in those zeros, then you will miss out on easy marks. Now, the other thing the examining team said was to make sure that you clearly indicate whether you're adding things or deducting them. So don't just put a list of positive figures and then use a cell formula to calculate the additions and deductions, show which ones are pluses, show which ones are minuses. And they suggested a single column which works quite well. So then you can do positives and negatives. Use the sum function in the spreadsheet where you've got a long list of numbers, saves you time. So you have got a calculator. Um, you can use your own calculator as well. You don't have to use the on-screen calculator if you're sitting remotely. And this question actually asked for taxable total profits, not just trading profits, which of course includes income and gains, property income as well. So an illustration of how you might present this, we've got single column showing the pluses and the minuses. So this one has the minuses in brackets. You can just show them with a negative. Um, you can make the minuses red, which highlights those as well, makes them stand out using the software. So make sure you practice so that you're happy with how to do all of those things. Simple workings on the face of the computation again. Zeros where we're not deducting something. And we've got separate workings for the more complicated figures. And the examining team specifically says to avoid putting detailed workings into one cell. It makes it very difficult for the marker to give you credit if you make any mistakes. So for example, the property income is quite a complex calculation. So a good idea would be to split that down. And if you get some of that wrong, you can still score some of the marks if it's clear what you have actually done with the other figures. So that would be an example of where you should show a separate working. The losses part was four marks, and it was to calculate the total unused losses to carry forwards after making the maximum possible loss relief and group relief claims. So again, what the examiner said for this one, four marks, the requirement is to calculate. So don't put lots and lots of explanations. Um, so there were comments that some students wrote pages before eventually getting to the right answer. It's four marks. It's calculating. You need some labels so that we can see what you're calculating. But a simple working is fine. You were given the brought forward losses, trading losses, property losses. The maximum offset against the company's own profits is just going to be an own figure rule mark if you've used your profits from part A, nice and easy. And then surrender as group relief. So again, this tests that 75% losses group rule. One of the companies wasn't part of the group relief group. So nothing could be surrendered to that company. And make sure that you state that as well. 
So those were some of the key points from the examiner's report. A few quick tips. So section A, make sure that you spend enough time, 1.8 minutes per mark. Do the easy questions first. You can flag those, come back to harder ones. Um, review all of the options for the multiple choice questions to make sure that you don't fall into a simple trap. Remember that you don't get any marks if you get it almost right, but you don't get marks taken away if you get it wrong. Have a go at all the questions and make sure that you practice. So there's lots of resources on the practice platform for you to have a go at. And then for section C, again, make sure that you allocate your time, follow the instructions, use pro forma computations, show your workings, make sure that you use formulae in the spreadsheets to calculate figures. And if you're doing a written answer, keep it short. And again, the more practice you do, the easier it gets. So another quick poll. When is the pre-March 24 mock going to be released? So there is a mock which is going to be released on the practice platform for you to have a go at. Enter your option, please. 12th of Feb, 19th of Feb, 22nd of Feb, or no idea. Okay, I'll move on quickly so that we can move on to some questions. Uh, oh, so some of you have no idea. Well, the good news is that that pre-March 24 mock is out today, 12th of February. And there will be mock debriefs. Anybody know when those are going to be released? 16th of Feb, 19th of Feb, 22nd of Feb. Absolutely no idea. Again. What do you reckon? <laughs> well, oh, good selection there. The answer is the 16th of February. So that was really just to highlight to you, if you didn't know already, that there is a full mock exam, all of section A, section B, section C on the practice platform. And there are debriefs as well. So debriefs for all of the section C questions on that. Um, similar to what I've been doing today, but to show you how to present your answers in the software, how to mark those, uh, and then running through some of the trickier bits from sections A and B as well. So now let's have a look at your questions. Um, I'm going to move on to my question folder to see the questions that you've been sending in. Um, so I'm just going to pick out some of the key ones here. The, this is a really good question. Time constraints, which section to tackle first and how long to spend on each section? Now, when it comes to spending your time in the exam and which section you do first, you should always make sure that you allocate 1.8 minutes per mark. So if you think section A is 15 questions, two marks each, 1.8 minutes per mark. So you should be looking to spend 54 minutes on section A. And then if you work that out for all the other questions as well, um, which one to, to tackle first is purely down to personal preference. Now, when I was doing my exams, I used to like to do the objective test questions first because there were always a few straightforward ones in there and you know it got me thinking. Um, however, some people prefer to do the long questions first. It is entirely up to you. So the most important thing is that you practice. So use the mock exam as a trial run. Have a go and say, well, do I prefer to do section A first? Do I prefer section C? But the key thing is that you allocate your time and you stick to it, OK? So don't overrun. Make sure that you do all of the areas to make sure that you do actually um, stand a really good chance of passing. What are the areas to focus to pass the exam? So another good question. That's a, a question that often I get asked is, which are the important parts of the syllabus? Well, of course, in your exam, in total, there are 33 questions, including all of section A and section B. And section A particularly could test anything. Section B, 
roughly nearly always inheritance tax, capital gains tax, VAT, but there are still quite a lot of different areas. We know that we've got a question on income tax. We know we've got a question on corporation tax. But really, it's a case of if you focus on just a very few areas, you're going to reduce your chances of passing. So I would say that you need to make sure that you've got a good knowledge of all the key taxes. You know, you know, income tax, employment income, self-employment income, corporation tax. You know how to do all the inheritance tax computations, capital gains, the key reliefs, um, VAT, some of the key points. And then for Section A, that's where we often get questions on things like admin, penalties, that kind of thing. And you only need 50 percent to pass. But the more you know, the more likely you are to be able to get 50%. OK. Um, were the last two exam deemed easy based on the responses received by the examiners on the feedback forms? I don't actually know the answer to that question. And uh, so I would say that generally the answer is that all exams are going to be roughly the same level. Um, whether you find it easy is generally dependent on how much work you've done. So I don't think that any of the exams are particularly easier or more difficult than others. And what you also need to remember is that we don't always see, we don't ever see the full exams. So it might be that one of the questions that's been released, you find easy, but then you, know, you don't know what the section A questions were from that exam. So I would say that most exams are pretty much on the same level overall, although obviously there might be some questions that are easier than others. Um, I've got a question here about how to memorize, for example, reliefs and losses conditions. Well, that's a very good question as well. How do you memorize all of the rules? Um, the best way to do it is by practicing, by testing yourself. So practice as many questions as you can. Um, for things like loss relief conditions and uh, capital gains reliefs, you might find it useful to have flashcards, you know, pre prepare yourself some flashcards. What are the conditions for gift holdover relief? What are the conditions for business asset disposal relief? And just make yourself recall those. The worst thing to do is just read them. So reading things doesn't generally make them sink in, but practicing them, explain them to your parents, your children, your dog, um, that tends to help a little bit more. Um, let's have a look here. So we've got some questions. I think this was questions about um, some of the ones that I looked at from section A, which was about the national insurance, class four national insurance. Would property income be included? And the answer is no. So property income, whatever type of property income, is not subject to national insurance contributions. Um, we have a question on tips for tax planning questions. So hopefully, again, I've been through some of the tips for the tax planning type questions. So the ones where you have alternative investments, very similar to what we saw here. I think the key is to make sure that you spend enough time thinking before you actually prepare your answer. So um, in one of the previous examiner's reports, the examiner's comment about the 10 mark question was that if it seems to be becoming very complicated, then you're probably doing it wrong. So the key thing again is to practice as much as you can. So practice and hopefully those will get easier. But for the tax planning questions, the key is to think before you answer, think very carefully, what kind of tax am I dealing with? Am I dealing with an individual who's an employee? Am I dealing with a company who might also be an employer? Um, in terms of revision strategy, so revision strategy, the key really between now and the exam should be applying your knowledge to questions. So make sure that you do actually practice questions. So that's really where your focus should be going. And if you find that you're practicing questions and you can't answer them, then that's when you need to go back and have a look at the technical content. And uh, let me just have a look. Uh, question, what can be tested in section B? So I think I have answered that. It could be anything, but it's most likely to be inheritance tax, capital gains tax, and VAT. Um, another question about the order, which we've run through. And 
Let's have a look. Can we use our own calculators? The answer to that is uh, yes, you can. Um, and I think, are we running out of time, Martin? Yeah, you can pick one or two more. I think we have a minute left. One or two more. So let me just have a look here. I'm sort of working in order from the bottom to the top. Um, oh, question here from a reset. I've scored 46% twice. It's frustrating. I bet it is. Yeah. So I think with 46%, um, it probably is more of an exam technique issue rather than a lack of knowledge. So usually when somebody says that they failed the exam, um, if they're very close, then it's more likely to be poor exam technique. If they're way off, then it's a lack of technical knowledge. So for 46%, I would say make sure you're practicing questions to exam time. Um, practice as much as you can and make sure you use all of the resources on the practice platform to do that. So particularly using the software and look at how you're presenting your answers as well. Are you clearly showing all of your computations and making sure that you break things down? OK. So it is two o'clock now. I'll hand back to you then, Martin. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen, for that great session and the great insights that you've shared with us. Uh, lots of questions there, but um, also thank the students for lots of the engagement mm -hmm. and appreciate the rest of the ACCA team in the back end responding to the questions. So that's all the time we had for the session today. Please remember you'll get a link to access the recording of this session in case you missed anything or you'd want to listen uh, over to it uh, over again. Do, do look out for an email with the link to access the recording. The examiner's report is available on the ACCA website in the student support mm -hmm. uh, resources. So do head over there, download a copy and review it in much more detail. And that should go a long way in helping you with your preparations. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for finding time to attend the session and best of luck from us at ACCA. Thank you very much and good luck.